Hello. So I'm Einar and this is Jonas. And, and this is a talk at Lambda Days. Uh, very nice to be back. Um, yeah, so just to make sure, uh, not always when we do a talk, uh, people sort of uh, understand that the talk has begun, but so now the talk has begun. And I suppose the way the talk is going to work is that Jonas has, he's sitting typing in, in Emacs, and he's going to type stuff, and I will sort of respond to the stuff that he's typing, and sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll point up like, to this pretty picture, and I will hope that I not point up the right thing. But yes, we'll see. Uh, so maybe we should explain the title for the talk, you think? Yes, yeah, so the title for the talk is from when I watched like, YouTube videos of these lectures, and I accidentally turned on the YouTube type subtitles. And he said something like, there's a gamma with an X. Yeah, you can't really a. see it, you probably, un uh, unless your eyesight is really good, but it says, and you have a guy with an X, which is kind of surprising given the topic of, you know, the lecture. Uh, so when I had to, like, name my history of that, uh, I recalled that thing. So that's why the title is weird. So now we have the X of type I, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have, so for a proper talk, you have an uh, agenda, and we also have an agenda. So and this is the agenda. Yeah, and now my laser pointer is no longer working, so we have like 30 seconds worth of, of laser, uh, <laughs> which is going to be interesting. Um, but okay, uh, so it's a, it's a nice uh, short uh, agenda, uh, also incomprehensible, but sort of that's what we're going to try to work through during the talk. So sort of understanding this stuff is, is what the talk is okay, all so about. Kind of getting a feel for what's going on here and how it relates to programming is kind of what we're aiming for. So if this makes no sense at this point, uh, then that's cool. If it makes no sense after yes. the talk, then that's a bit less cool. Yeah, so sort of a premise for the talk is that logic is very difficult and programming is easy. So, so, so this is now the, the difficult version and I'm going to transform it into the easy version because we know how to write programs yeah. and maybe not how to write proofs. So we see there's a lot of, lot of symbols going on here. Yeah, um, we're going to walk through them. Yeah, so we have like stuff like this and then this is the conjunction thing. It's like and and this is the disjunction. It's like or and this is implication. So we can read this as something like, um, well, A and B implies C, implies A implies B implies C. So now everything was made clear. Yes. Uh, uh, and that's like one part of the notation is to understand what these symbols mean. And then there's the symbols, the sequence, which are these symbols. Right, so those, that's the, what I call the fainted T symbol. Uh, but that's properly called a sequent. Yeah. Or sequent. I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, and kind of problem here is that most of the notation seems to mean that mean implication. So the sequence is kind of like like implication. It says that if I know that T is true, then Q is true. Uh, so the stuff before the sequence symbol, if it's true, then we know that the stuff after the sequence symbol is true. If right. we look back at, at the large picture, uh, we see that there's a lot of statements on the form of, well, if this and this and this is true, then this should Right, so true. if I could point now to the lowest line, uh, that seems to uh, state that uh, given nothing in particular, then the last stuff yeah, is so true, Yeah, so usually right? we end up with something like this uh, that says that Given no assumptions, we know that this is true. Right. So that's the kind of thing we are interested in and proving of. Yeah. Um, and we will have multiple things before the sequence symbol. So there are multiple assumptions we can make, and then that's one thing we are interested in proving. Right. And then you have you have this name. You call it antecedents on the left hand side and consequence on the right hand side, which I like to call sort of the accidents on the right. Left hand side. Uh, Accidents is, uh, uh, and consequences right on the right hand side, yes. Uh, and then there's kind of more stuff about. Okay, that's a lot of text. Um, so 
So we're using this. Wikipedia calls it a uh, tree-like notation. Uh, mm -hmm. So you see here that uh, it's, so it's this one is large tree. Uh, yeah. If anyone saw like the Philip Gardner talk earlier, uh, 2016, I think, and maybe in the one last year as well, yeah. then you might have seen stuff like these dotted lines uh, for, what do we call it, hypothetical judgments. Um, right. That's basically just another way of, uh, of writing the same stuff as we're yeah, writing? So or We're doing kind of the same stuff, but we're using a slightly different notation because we have built programs to make drawings and we didn't want to do the dotted lines. So this is an alternative notation, but it's supposed to be kind of the same stuff that Rodler talked about in his talk. Okay. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that's that bit. So, right. you can quickly show that instead of doing the dotted line and the A with the brackets around, yeah. uh, we do something like put the A. Yeah, so that's yet another symbol, sort of this uh, diving board symbol? Yeah, the diving board symbol, the gamma. Uh, we'll get back to that. Okay. Uh, but it's, you know, it stands for whatever other uh, antecedents. Okay, to right, okay. Uh, it looks very sort of logic y for me. It looks very logic, yeah. Yes. Uh, it's pretty clear. Um, and then there's the horizontal lines. So, right. if you look back at the agenda, the live agenda. Right. So, then we have a bunch of, of uh, horizontal lines. Yeah, so you see there's a line, and then, then there's some kind of letter or something to the right of it. Yeah. And there's all this stuff underneath, and sometimes stuff above the line. Mm -hmm. uh, and you kind of read it like, well, if the stuff above the line is true, then by applying this rule, we can infer that the stuff beneath the line is true. Right, so those are names for rules on the right-hand side? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So it's the H rule and the W rule and right. the implication. And at rules. this point, we don't really know what those rules are, but we're going to work walk yeah, through we'll get that. To that. Yeah. Um, then there's one additional thing. Um, oh, that's even more text. A bunch of text. So this is from the proposition as type paper. Uh, it says a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And the important bit is that uh, if you're doing programming, we often like to use different symbols. So instead yeah. of implication, we're going to write this arrow symbol for. Yeah. So those look part. sort of more familiar. To the symbols we've seen before in programming, right? And instead of the conjunction and disjunction symbol, we're going to use this, or sometimes this, right. uh, and plus for uh, disjunction. Mm -hmm. So that would be like uh, product types and some types yeah. in, in functional programming, yes. So we can just draw the same kind of proof tree with uh, our new symbols. Yeah, we so get this stuff, and at the end here, it starts to kind of look like the type of a program. Yeah, that looks more fam familiar in, in terms of the symbols. So you, you might have seen a type signature like this at some point. Yeah. Um, so, let's kind of yeah, a brief journey through the notation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're going to look at like, what the different rules means, yeah. and hopefully they make sense as kind of logic rules. Yep. And possibly also as programming rules. Okay. So it's kind of we we're working within a kind of simple logic system where we have like a number of axioms, uh, which is this right. one. So there you have sort of nothing on top. Yeah. Uh, and the rule says that if we assume that A is true, then we can like given that assumption uh, decide that A must be true. Uh, no. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's. Probably not terribly co controversial. It sounds sort of obvious that. Okay, so the, under the assumption that A is true, A must be true. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, and and now, what's the role of the diving board in that context? Yeah, and it says that, uh, you know, whatever else we assume to be true mm -hmm. before A, uh, it doesn't matter as long as the, the last assumption we make is that A is true, 
and this will set that we can conclude that A must be true. Right. So you could, in, in principle, uh, assume other things to be true as well, but that doesn't really uh, have yeah, much to do with the true. rule. So okay. the, the gamma symbol can stand for anything. Okay. Even nothing, presumably. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so in order to like possibly get a feel for how these rules are applied, uh, we can look at some examples. So this kind of the simplest one. If we assume that A is true, then A must be true. Uh, yeah. And here the gamma symbol stands for nothing. So there, mm, no there is no gamma number. there. And as we see, we can assume that A is true and that P is true, and from that we can conclude that P must be true. Yeah, so again, A doesn't really have any bearing on yeah. on that. So these aren't like, mm, yeah, they shouldn't be like controversial, controversial statements to make. Right. Uh, and it's maybe not obvious that they are useful, but it's kind of, you might get a feel for like, how we apply the rules. Um, you see that the, the gamma symbol we used in the rules can stand for this thing and this thing and this mm -hmm. thing. Uh, so here, Apparently it can stand for a whole bunch of things, right? Yeah, so given that A, B, C, D, and E, and F are true, yeah. we know that F must be true. And if we had a more regression logic, we would have more axioms and stuff, but we don't. Right, so we, we want to sort of have few, few rules, right? Yeah, so at least for this talk, we want to have a pretty minimal set of rules. Mm -hmm. we, don't yeah. want to spend, we need to spend some time talking about each of them. So this is another rule now. This is the W rule. Uh, so what, what does that stand for? So W stands for weakening. Uh -huh. And it says that, um, Sort of, if you have proved that A is true, uh, given some set of assumptions, mm -hmm. uh, then you know that A is still true even if you make more assumptions. So you right. can, so the stuff under the line is uh, a weaker proposition than the stuff above the line. Right, so you're making more assumptions, but still concluding the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And again, there is this gamma symbol that can stand for whatever. Uh, when yeah. we apply the rule, this gamma above the line and this gamma beneath the line must be the same. So it must be in the same context with one additional assumption. Right, so it, has, it can stand for whatever, but it needs to be the same whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a couple of examples. So the simplest one. Uh, well, if we use the H rule example from earlier, the hypothesis rule. Yeah. We know that given the assumption of A, A must be true, and then we can add additional assumptions and it kind of doesn't change that we yeah, know you can, that A must be true. You can sort of keep going and adding as many assumptions as you like, yeah. and then you have this sort of pyramid of Yeah, so we can build pyramids from this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and we can build better pyramids. Yeah, uh, if we so you, yeah okay, so you, uh, you don't have to go further up there, in some sense. Yeah. Um, so those are kind of uh, the axiom, sort of the thing we know that is true, mm -hmm. and the rule we have for manipulating uh, the list of antecedents with stuff that comes before the sequence symbol. Right. The remaining rules are kind of more familiar programming rules. Yeah, because this is not so progr programmer-like in some sense. It's not the stuff you like usually think about during programming, at mm -hmm. least. But functions we do think about, so. Yeah. Uh, so this is like the function rules, or the implication rules, if you like. Uh, and it has an introduction rule uh, named sort of arrow i for introduction. Okay, so and you're I'm introducing a function-like thing, or an implication? Yeah. So it says that if given some set of assumptions, and the assumption a, you know that b must be true. Right. Then you can turn this into a proof of the same assumptions uh, minus the A proves that sort of that A implies B or that there is a function from A to B. Okay. And then there is the elimination rule. Uh, here the context is the same everywhere. Yeah, so, but, but now you have sort of two things up there, uh, two turnstiles or two Yeah, so that's keys. kind of when the proof tree becomes a tree. 
Yeah, so it branches there. So there, those are two different expressions yeah. on top, right? So it kind of says that if you can prove that A implies B, and you can prove B, uh, and you can prove A, uh, then you can turn that stuff into a proof of B. Yeah, so that's sort of similar to function application, right? So if you have a function from A to B, and then you have a value of A, then you can get a, a value of B. Yeah, yeah, that's very similar. Uh, so we have an example of that, where we use the H rule to say, assuming that A is true, A must be true, and you can use this introduction rule to turn this into uh, this proposition. Mm -hmm. It says that A implies A, or it says that there is a function from A to A. Right, okay. Uh, so at this point, it starts to look like a program you could have written. So yeah, I the suppose. function that takes an A and gives you back an A uh, that sounds, sounds like the identity function. And yeah. It doesn't take like an enormous amount of functional programming skills to write that function. Right. So we need a programming language to sort of work Yeah, so we this. want to do this in a kind of lambda calculus way. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have uh, a programming language we can use to write these programs. Uh, and it has lambdas to make functions. It has variables that them. Yeah, so the top stuff there looks like lambda calculus, right? Yeah, so we have variables and we have these functions we can make with lambdas. Uh, these are going to have like, function types or implication types. And we have function application. And later on we will see that we, in addition, have like tuples in order to do the conjunction or the uh, product types. Right. And we are going to have some types which are like discriminated units. Right, so you have extended the traditional lambda calculus with, uh, with the tuples and... Uh, yeah, with product and sums. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So now we should be able to implement this function on our own, right? Right, so this is your type signature and then you're yes, gonna... Yes, so I'll, I'll write a type signature. Uh -huh. And I will write the function. Yeah, so that would be the identity function, right? Yeah, so that's the identity function. It should check out as an A to A function. Yep, sounds good. And I can send that to the racket program I have running in the background, and it will return a picture to me and draw it in me. Okay, so uh, because what's really going on is not just that you're showing this picture again, but there is some sort of... Yeah, so we're showing the same picture again, but we kind of did a bunch of under the hood. Right, so you send this expression now to your racket program yeah. to do the type checking to see that it matches. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is now uh, the result of your type check is this image. Is that right? Yeah, you can mm -hmm. say that. Okay. And yeah, we can also show it with the actual sort of program level terms we are using. Mm -hmm. Say that I want to turn my drawing and make the function again. Right, so now it looks slightly similar. Now you have your sort of parts of your program um, yeah. annotated with a type. So you can, at this point, you can kind of see that this introduction rule here uh, introduces a lambda. Right, so it introduces it going, if you go from top to down. If you go to, from top to down, it introduces a lambda. Yeah. Uh, if we go the other way, it kind of seems like we're using a lambda in order to get an x of type A within scope so that we can refer to it. Yes, okay. And then you can sort of, yeah, then you don't have to do any more uh, except uh, applying the H rule yeah. to say that's okay. It's checked out, basically. And we can do like, so we don't have a lot of types other than A's and B's here. Uh, and we don't have a lot of functions lying around. Mm -hmm. But we can mm -hmm. do like, uh, sort of say that if we have an A to B, and we have, then if we have an A, then we should be able to get a B. Yeah. So we have a function, this is to be the A to B function. Yeah. Uh, and we have an A, then I should be able to call the function with the A I got. 
Yeah, right. So that's that will be uh, the A. Yeah, so you're giving that to your F function. Yeah. Yeah, so the F function has to type A to B, and then you give it an A, and then you get a B. Okay. Yeah, so at this point, the proof this, starts this getting a little bit impressive, but yeah. the program didn't really get that impressive. So that's kind of the cool thing that we can write this. Right, so simple the programs and generate. Uh, yeah, because this is already kind of a big tree, right? So it's, it looks like, uh, yeah, you can build enormous trees with this, with just slightly bigger programs, right? Yeah. So, yeah, we can make them, like, grow outside the screens and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but we still have more rules to go through. Yeah. Um, so we we'll just leave that B and C as, take a look at, like, the product and sums. Um, yep. So the product rules, these are like the conjunction rules or the AND rules. Yeah, so this, the first rule is basically creating a tuple, is that correct? Yeah, and it kind of says that if you have an A and you have a B, then you have an A and B. Yeah, so... Uh, again, not a super comfortable, controversial statement to make. No. Uh, the, that's the introduction rule, so in order to make a tuple, you need to have like the first element and the second element. Yeah, so you... yeah. And the elimination rules, which are kind of how you use a pair or a tuple when you have one, says that you can get the first element or the second element. So yeah, again, this is not terribly controversial because if you have an A and a B, yeah, you certainly you have an A and certainly you have a B as well. So we can write, again, we can write some programs. Uh, so we can see that A implies that B implies and B, which is to right. say that sort of, if you yeah, give so you me an A and then give me a B, you can I construct can a tuple. Here are those. Yeah. Right, yes. So the lambda A, lambda B, this could be of type A and B. And yeah. we can make a pair, a tuple like this. Yes. And then we get a nice proof of it. Right, uh, but, but it's kind of strange for me. Uh, okay, I see you're, you're writing programs. Uh, um, what's sort of unusual is that you're, you're not really running them, right? So you're not really evaluating oh, them, yeah. you're just... We... So sometimes you write programs in order to run them. Yeah. Uh, but we read this book, once uh, structure and interpretation of computer programs. And it says that programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. So um, it seems that by not never running the programs, we eliminate a lot of incidental complexity. Yeah, but you sort of now you have programs that are written for both people to read and also for machines to type check or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, see, we could maybe take a look at this one and see what happens if it doesn't type, type check. Yeah, the, yeah, so that would be interesting if you sort of. For instance, maybe you turned a tuple around or something like that. Yeah, so we're sort of trying to prove this thing, but if we make an expression that will end up having the yeah. B and A type instead of the A and B type. Uh, right, so now you have, I don't know if you can see it, but it's colored red on the top of each of those branches. Yeah, so the, the picture kind of is, is the type error. It right. fails, or it's the nice proof. It, it's it a fails. very sort of succinct way of saying this is how your program failed to type check. Yeah, so an image is like worth a thousand words. Yeah. So if you want like sort of Scala quality type errors yeah. uh, without actually typing a thousand words, you can draw a picture instead. Right. Because you can see over on top, for instance, to the right there, uh, that okay, you try to match an A of type B with an A of type A, and obviously that's, that's not going to check out. Yeah, so it seems fine if you read it from the bottom up. Uh, it seems okay, but when you get to like, yeah, I'm trying to prove that this A expression I wrote is of type B. Yeah. Uh, it tries to apply some rules and it fails. Right. Um, yeah, we should probably just move on. Um, yeah, so this is now your, uh, your some type. Yeah, so the some type uh, says that in order to prove A or B, 
you have to prove either A or B. Yeah, so this would be like your left constructor and your right constructor. Yeah, so it has two introduction rules. Yeah. Uh, one saying that sorry, if you hand me an E, no, an A, then uh, I can give you back a proof of A or B. Yeah. Uh, and the other one for B. So you just need to supply one or the other. The complicated bit is that in order to do something with it, you need to handle both cases. So yeah, and then you have three branches, in fact, yeah. on top. So you need to kind of you need to have an sort of either A or B, and you need to sort of under the assumption that it is an A, uh, explain how to get some result out of that, yeah. and under the assumption that it is a B, then get some result out of that. Right. So and this matches a case expression. Yeah. In your programming language, right? So we can let me do we can do a simple example first. Uh, mm -hmm. A implies A or B, and we have an A and B A. Right. And so what's going, should we just walk through it so we have an implication, uh, introduction? Uh, yeah. So if you go sort of from the bottom up. Yeah. So we wrote lambda A. Uh, lambda introduces a function. Yeah, so that's a function. Corresponds to the function introduction rule. Yeah. Uh, and then we wrote left A, yep. which is the rule we just looked at. Uh, yeah, that's, so that's that one, yes, to the left. Most, mm -hmm. uh, sort of some introduction rule. Yep. And then it sort of adds enough. Uh, so it just needs the hypothesis rule. But yep. at the end, it will just add enough weakening rules in order to sort of get to the variable you're interested in. Okay. Uh, and we can do like a simple... Uh, we can... Or we can do like B to... Maybe you need a capital B. Is that capital right? B. Yep. Lambda B. And then we have to do this... Uh, Right here, rule. Mm -hmm. uh, so that checks out. What would happen if you did sort of left? Right, left. Right, left. And we can get this, and it. Yeah. So now we have a type error. A type uh, error again. Right, yeah. This. So sort of as, as long as we don't get any red text, this will be good. Right. Mm. So we can go back to the agenda we started with. Yeah, so that's what we wanted to understand in the first place. But this now again looks like logic. So yeah, this one looks like lo logic, but we can sort of translate it to the rules we started with. Uh, sort of yeah, translate it to the kind of functional programming symbols. Yeah. Uh, I'm using the wrong symbol. I think you're using the wrong symbol because you need yeah, so if it translates this, then we get... I think you still have the wrong symbols because you need a star and an arrow, right? Yes. Uh, this looks a lot more fam familiar, right? So you need a function. Yeah, from, so yeah. Sort of the bottom line of the, of the proof is kind of the thing that was proven to be false, even though there are sort of no other assumptions made. So yeah. This is kind of the theorem we are proving. Right. And we translate it to something that looks more like programming. Yep. And we try to make a program. It's not terribly hard to write that program now because... It's not super hard. So you just let basically the types guide you as you do the type. Yeah. So this thing is a function from A and B to C. Yep. Uh, and this thing is like the first argument. To yeah, the so that would be your F, thing. right? So this F should have... Uh, that type, yep. and we have an A and a B. Yeah. So these three uh, lambda with parameters correspond to okay, this thing and an A and a B. Yeah. So now probably you need to sort of combine the A and the B and pass it to C uh, to F. Is that correct? Because yeah. that's sort of the only way I can see working so with this. We want to end up with a C. Yes. Uh, given these things, and the function we have that 
if there's a C, it's the A and the C function, so we will yep. apply that function. Right. And we can make a pair of the A value and the B value. Uh, since well, that function requires like this type, yep. and we have an A lying around and we have a B lying around. Yeah. Yeah. Now this looks uh, not quite the same because now you have this Fermi way of drawing it, right? Yeah. So we can sort of okay, we can check. And then you can do the same thing. And now you see that we have, basically, that's the uh, agenda again, right? Yeah, so that's the same picture. Mm -hmm. uh, we can go back to... I find it easier, though, to, to read the Fermi one, because then I can see the parts of the program that are matched to different types. Yeah. So, sort of, in more programming notation, we have this thing. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if we want to like go through it and see what those correspond to which things. Yeah, maybe we should do that. So, so it, because we need to understand the agenda to sort of understand the talk, I think. Yeah. So the first one is that you have this this function. Yeah. So we kind of start out with like these three uh, lambdas, which yeah. introduces three functions. Mm -hmm. So you find the introduction rules for functions. Is right. The proof. So the first one sort of introduces the F, or first or last, depending on if you're going from the bottom or from the top. Yeah. So yeah, first from the bottom introduces the F. So then and you still sort of assume the F, right? At the line above, you have an F available, sort yeah. of in scope. It's sort of in scope, okay. Yeah. Because that also sounds programming. -like. Yeah. And then there's another lambda, yeah. so we move up and get an A in scope. Yeah, so now you add that to the scope in some sense. Yeah, and we have another lambda, uh, yeah. so we get the B in scope. Right. And then there's the function application. Right, uh, so that would be sort of the uh, arrow E all the way to the, to the right there. Yeah, over here it's an arrow E. Uh, so it's the elimination rule, which is what happens. So eliminating a function is using it. Yeah, uh, right, yeah, so applying it. And you can see that uh, here it branches, so the function elimination rule are like two things about the line. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says that sort of in order to prove this thing with the function elimination rule, we need to prove that there is a function from A and B to C. Right. And that we have an A and B. Right, so that's interesting because what's going on on the left-hand side there basically means that you're, you're looking through what you have in scope until you find your function, yeah. is that right? So, so you're sort of weakening or... So when you go like from the bottom to the top with weakening rules, you're kind of just throwing stuff away from scope. Yeah, because that's not what you're looking for in the scope, right? So you're kind of looking for the F. Yeah, uh, and you don't need the other ones. No. But on the other side there, what you need is... So it's, um, we're, let's see. So we have gotten to like this part really. Yeah. Uh, where we must show that we have or can make a pair right. of type yes. A and B. And, and for that you need an A and a B, of course. Yeah, right. So we use this uh, product introduction rule. So I have to prove A and B. Yeah, there's, so there's a lot of noise in the context sort of that makes that look harder than it really is. Because all you need really is an A and a B. Yeah. So, so again, we're just applying sort of the appropriate amount of weakening in order to get to the variable variable. Yeah, so for the right hand side, that's nothing. And then just one step basically to find the A in the scope. Yeah. In the middle of the tree there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's not a super uh, complicated function. Uh, right. But it generates a kind of nice looking tree. Yeah, so that's that's a function you use all the time in sort of best practice yeah, so uh, if functional we saw programming. The, right? the keynote to David Donsai, yeah, he told everyone you should use the query function all the time everywhere. Yeah, because that's uh, the sort of the virtuous way to go with functional programming is to use currying everywhere. Yeah, so so, the, so let's see. So yeah, this proof we started with turns out to be the curry function. Yep. Uh, we have 
bit more time so we can just yep. uh, skip past some of the like some rules. Right. So we can sort of write a program that uses all the things. Yeah, use all the things at once. Yeah. So let's see if we have an A to C and B to C. Um, see, and if we have an A or B, right, then we should be able to get the C back. Okay. Hopefully. Yep. Okay. Um, so we're going to write this program. Um, so the first thing is a pair. That's going to be a function with that signature. So that's going to be no. It's lab. a pair with that signature. So it's a pair. Of oh, that's functions. right. Yes. Yeah. So it's a of pair. Of yes. Recipe. It's a pair of functions. And so that's the first element. Mm -hmm. It's this pair that contains the two functions. Right. The two. And the next element, the next argument, is this a or b. Right. So it's going to be a value a or value b. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the idea is that. We need to do like case analysis on yep. the A or B thing, right? And call the appropriate function. Right. So then you need to, yeah. So th the first thing would be to sort of pick that thing apart. Yeah. So we've sort of briefly looked at the syntax for this order. Yep. And um, we can say, that, well, if it's a left thing, uh, then we can call. Yeah. So then you need to pick out the. Uh, the first function from your pair. Yeah. And apply that to, to, to A, right? Not to B. Probably to A. Yeah. Uh, and if it's the right thing. And you pick out the second, second the function. Second yeah. and apply it to the B. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. So at this point, it's really easy to like. Make an okay looking proof because if there's something red to the right of the screen, you won't see it. Right. The kind of scary thing is that you don't, you need to see the entire picture to see any type error. So if you make a type error all the way to the right, maybe you don't see it. Yeah. So if you're trying to get it like fast code review, you want to make type errors to the right. Right. You need big screens probably for, for code reviews. Yeah. Uh, again, the point kind of is that uh, this isn't a super impressive program. And like if you've done a bit of Haskell or a bit of standard ML or something, you'd probably be able to write something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, and you can turn it into this thing that at least impresses programmers because programmers don't uh, really it, it know about it. It impresses me. So. Yeah, so that's a start. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and probably if you wanted to prove sort of the, the last line there, maybe you wouldn't really know where to start, but you would be able to, to go the other way. Around. So the last line in the... Yeah, basically the last line in the proof. If you're tasked with, okay, prove that. Yeah, so we can, again, we can like uh, look at it. So then, a bit more logic here. Symbols. Yeah. So basically prove the last one. I wouldn't really know where to start. But. Yeah, so this looks like, like logic, so we don't know what we're doing. But if yeah. we translate it to something that looks like programming, we might know. Yeah. Yeah. And still we're not uh, running the programs, just checking them. Yeah. So we've like, been looking around in the literature for excuses for not to run our program. Yeah. And I think the, I'm not sure if this is a direct quote, but uh, Robin Milner says something like, real type programs cannot go wrong, but they also can't go wrong if they can't go at all. Yeah. It's so so be, be best probably not to run them at all. Yeah, that seems safe. Also, you don't have to spend time implementing like a runtime. You can make only this type of thing. Yeah, so that sounds like the logical thing to do. Yeah. Um, so I think we're kind of done. Yeah. So, so maybe we should stop the talk. So just to be explicit, the talk is ending now. Um, let's take a few questions.
Uh, is it possible to do something like this for Haskell for bigger language? Can you answer, please? Uh, what is, uh, is it possible to do something with Haskell for uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm real bad at hearing questions. So. so I think the question is, can you can you basically do the same thing, but for something as complicated or complex as Haskell? For right. So language? we have a very simple language now, but could we do? All oh, right. Uh, so at least if we stick to like the sort of the part of Haskell that is in a standard and doesn't use it, like and pays for Mayo and stuff, um, people like to write these kinds of trees for or these kinds of rules for describing programming languages to begin with. So I think like most of Haskell probably has like uh, rules like this uh, in some spec somewhere. Mm -hmm. But I'm, yeah, they're really simple for the really simple type. Mm -hmm. But you, you have similar rules for like depend type stuff and, and sort of everything that is close to type theory. I wonder, do you have the, uh, this project to draw those uh, proofs of open source? Yeah, so uh, probably just show them your GitHub repo. Because everything is online, right? Yeah, I'm not online, but the GitHub repo is. Yeah. Uh, so it's this, um, let's see, so the way I... Yeah, so basically you need Emacs and Racket installed, is that right? Yeah, so you need, an, you need to have Racket and you need to have Emacs and the Emacs should be able to draw pictures. And um, let's see. And what I'm doing is, ooh, not bad. Uh, I set the sort of Emacs home directory to the repo, and I start Emacs, and I run this first line of Emacs list, and then you can sort of do the same stuff. Yeah. Yes. But yeah, all the code is available. Okay, um, let's give our speakers a closing round of applause.